Now, it was a problem for a preacher because you really want to make sure you're not sort of seeming to aim your sermon at any particular person in the congregation, okay? And there are times in any preacher's life when, you know, you're, you're preaching at... You're pre relax, everybody relax. <laughs> you're preaching at a sermon and somebody comes to you after you how can you say that about me today? And you think, oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> oh, what's this about? It's something I don't know. Right? Well, I've got to tell you, this sermon today, I'm sure, is aimed at a particular member of this congregation. Um, and I feel that particular person might well be me. Uh, because uh, it is one I have to fight and struggle with. And I'm telling you that now. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you are called to peace. And be thankful. Now we're not going to get past that, but then it goes on to say, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as you teach and admonish one another, with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, I've got so much to say about that, I can start already, with gratitude in your hearts to God, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Loads of people get in the public view telling you what Christianity says, believes, teaches or whatever. And it troubles me to wonder where half of it comes from. Now we've said all along, Paul isn't simply concerned with these Colossians. Christian theology. We've said that. He's, he's been dealing with various things through the book. And of course he's had to deal at a certain point just recently. He's had to deal with you know, the error in Colossae. And deal with, really attack the, the theological presuppositions that are, are harming these people's spiritual lives at Colossae. But to undo the spiritual harm that the doctrinal error had caused, and to rebuild their spiritual life strong and secure on the basis of a good, right relationship with Jesus, that's what he's about. And he's saying, look, a life family firmly built on Jesus looks like this. And that's what he's doing in our verses today. He's emphasizing what a life that's actually properly built on Jesus, a proper relationship with Jesus, results in. Because they've got that all screwed up in, in Colossae as they've got their theology screwed up and so on and so forth. It's all about the peace of Christ ruling in your hearts. It's all about the word of Christ dwelling in you richly and working out into the world in the way he describes. And it's all about doing the deeds of Jesus. It's about the peace of Christ, it's about the word of Christ, and it's about the work of Christ. But we're not going to get as far as that. <laughs> No way! These three fundamental things flesh out what it means to have that right relationship with Jesus going on. Which the heresy has really shot to bits for them. It's ruined that relationship. Not because it's wrong, but because of the effects that it's had on them. The things they've aspired to in Christ and all the rest of it. We've seen that in previous weeks. These three things. He says, look, that right relationship with Jesus is going to get fleshed out like this. The peace of Christ will rule in your hearts. The word of Christ will dwell in you richly. And your deeds will be the deeds that can be genuinely described as done in the name of Jesus. They'll be Jesus' deeds. Here's the place then where Paul now, by this middle of the third chapter of Colossians, is summarising the heart of individual Christian spirituality in the particular situation of those troubled Christians at Colossae. He's showing us what individual Christian spirituality amounts to. Not that it leads to, not all that it leads to, but, but he's laying open the nub of the matter for these Colossian Christians as to how walking with God in Christ works out. He's pointing them back to Jesus, to their relationship with Jesus. That's how he's dealing with this damage of this heresy. And it is directly from Jesus that the fleshing out of their life with Jesus gets observed here. He is our peace. He is the Word of God. He is God in action in the world. It's from Him it comes. And that's important to what we're looking at today. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you are called to peace and be thankful. Okay, verse 15. The peace of Christ. Now, if you come from a certain church tradition, you may see this because you're in the student, you know, they talk about the peace. Have you come across the peace? The peace is one of the most embarrassing things that can possibly happen in any church gathering. <laughs> what happens is, at some point, a blog up the front end address turns to you and says, let us offer one another a sign of the peace. And they all get up and they trot around and they all sort of hug each other and <laughs> <laughs> kiss and shake hands. Well, peace, peace of the Lord be with you. It's peace. It's 
very embarrassing, most embarrassing thing. That's not what this is about. This is something completely different. Whatever the virtues or otherwise of that particular practice, this is not that. This is Christ's peace. Now just stop a second, because as evangelicals and as Bible-centered people, or aspiring to be Bible-centered people, we forget, very often it seems to me, the huge part in Paul's thinking that peace plays. It's huge in Paul's theology. Absolutely mega. At the beginning of so many of his letters, what does he say? Grace to you. Hang on. You missed something out. Peace. So many of those letters, peace to you. At the heart of the list of things he tells us that he prays for, for people, for these converts in wherever it is. Peace he prays for. Peace. In the list of the things the Spirit brings into the lives of the Lord's faithful followers, love, joy, whack, peace. And we, we don't preach about it. We don't talk about peace. We talk about works, actually, quite often. But we don't talk about peace very much. That idea of peace sits right in the heart of Paul's letters. And of course that idea of peace sits right at the heart of Paul's theology of the cross and of atonement. What's the cross for? He brings peace through his blood shed on the cross. So this peace is what Jesus both embodies in himself and brings to his people. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. It's central issue. It's what he is, and it's what he brings. It's what he embodies, and it's what he conveys. So, John 14, 27 tells us, Jesus, peace I leave with you. What does he leave? What is... Uh, what's, what's the word? Um, what's our inheritance? What's his um, gift? Let's call it a gift. What's it? What do you leave in your world? You leave your. Um... Oh, so you're tired. Two things happen to me when I'm tired with my words. Either they grow and I use big ones, or I forget the ones I want. It's all very frustrating. Will and testimony. Yeah, that's one testament to your request. Comes. Yeah. 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 What he bequeaths to us. Yeah. yeah, it's what he bequeaths to us, isn't it? What he leaves to us. What he leaves to us is peace. Oh, you're in the will. There you go. Peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. My peace I give you. So he's both conveying it and he's, he's got it incorporated in himself. I don't give to you as the world gives. What does the world give? No, I give you peace. Because the heart of the matter. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. It's the start of every conversation in Arabia type area, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it can be a greeting in certain parts of the world, can't it? Um, I, I freak people out sometimes, because I've got so many days for the first time, I remember, I just say, peace to your house. You know, because there's that commission, isn't there, to, to the apostles when they go off, like, you know, when you enter a house, peace to, peace to your house, we all pardon. <laughs> well, they think he's a freak. I, I must watch that. Peace is something we don't make enough of. And as you say, it's an important greeting, so long as we don't just get used to it and, and ignore what's there. It's something we might have a tendency not to think enough about as a central part of the benefit of Jesus' life and ministry to us. He comes to bring you peace. Central, apparently, from John, from the passage we're looking at in Colossians 3, we need to do something or other to culture that peace that Christ would plant in the garden of our life. And he gives it, we might need to do some weeding. Or something. Look here in John 14. He gives this tender plant, but we are not to let our hearts be troubled. There's weeding to do around this tender plant, this precious plant. And don't we know it? It's back in Colossians 3. The peace of Christ, verse 15 in Colossians 3. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Trouble with our English translation here, and it's a limitation of the language, not a fault with the translation, is that the only words we've got we can use make it sound a bit like hot tub religion, you know? 
I'm not urging you to lie back in these. Lie back in these. Come across that? Not here. No, I know. <laughs> but, but you know what I mean. Slightly, yeah. Hot tub religion. Paco wrote a book, didn't he? Uh, oh yeah, it was called Laid Back Christianity in the UK. It's a few decades back. And in the States it was called Hot Tub Religion. That's probably where I got it from. So there you go. That's a, yeah, it's lie back and enjoy. Come to church on a Sunday, lie back and enjoy. We've got the band, we've got the, yeah. I'm jealous actually. It's a band, that'd be lovely. Um, <laughs> lie back and enjoy, be entertained. That really doesn't form any part of Paul's approach to the Christian life at all, it has to be said. But that peace with God that lies at the heart of the gospel, it is given you. You're not active in that. It's bought by Christ. Quite a price was paid. It cost him his blood. We can't contribute. And more than that, that price having been paid by Christ, it, he gives it to us out of his own initiative, his effort and initiative, not ours, gets made available to us by his initiative to which we cannot contribute again. That peace comes to us individually from Christ. He bought it, he gives it to the individual, but man can we turn away from it. Can we turn away from it? And we need to take action to ensure that we don't turn away from it. That's where the action comes. That piece of Christ needs to be given its place to rule. To rule. Now you know, I guess we all know, how panicky thoughts turn up on the scene and they skirmish around the garrison town of your consciousness. Don't they? Where did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> but they do. They kind of skirmish around the edges, don't they? You know, uh, how they turn up when you, you're sort of waking up in the night, you roll over in the night and they come and skirmish around the edges of your consciousness and they try to degrade the asset of your trust in Christ and your peace in the early hours of morning's first grey light, yeah, as you're just waking up, yeah, and things begin to bug you to worry about. Christ needs to be deliberately allowed back to rule and reign in our consciousness at these times when the brain is only half turned on. Because a lot of damage can get done there. A lot of damage can get done there as those doubts and those fears and those anxieties eat away at your subconscious consciousness and confidence in Christ. Those things can form personality as well. You know? Your waking thoughts, your half thoughts, when you're only half there, can form and damage your character and your responses that come from it, your habits of thought. You know how that happens when you're sort of half there or. or half conscious of what you're doing and these doubts are just skirmishing around and the peace of Christ needs to be brought back to rule. You know how sudden challenges can arise in life, you know about that. You see the potential for impending ruin rear up before you or life-changing events that shatter the carefully planned out time spent on organised situation and the enemy of souls jumps on your shoulder to cast doubts about Christ's sufficiency, even his vague interest in your situation. And Christ needs to be put back in the big seat, in the throne seat. Brought back into our consciousness as the all-sufficient saviour of the ends of the earth, the sovereign ruler of my heart, of the universe. And remember the donkey in Jerusalem, when he comes as king, he brings peace. That's the point, isn't it? His triumphal entry into Jerusalem is not on a war horse like a king returning to take up his rule. It's on a donkey, the king coming in peace. David after Absalom's rebellion to take out his reign of peace. When Christ comes back as king, he brings his peace with him. Peculiar that, isn't it? The way our world thinks is a bit opposite to that. So it is. The Greek word for rule is interesting, but we're going to come to that in a minute. I'll be distracted somewhere. Let the peace of Christ, that's what we're talking about, in your heart. Now this is not, now let's get this absolutely clear, this is not about some private and inward hidden peace of the soul, hidden away in some deep, subjective, peaceful disposition of the spirit. You can tell the man of peace. You know people who talk funny? Right? They're the ones. I'm, I'm not knocking people who talk funny and can't help it. I'm, I'm knocking the people who... No, 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 no. Forget it. That's not what we're talking about here. Heart is being used here in its normal Old Testament sense to describe the centre of your personality, the source of your will and your emotions and your thoughts and your affections. The peace of Christ is the whole sway over the whole of the reader's lives by taking its command centre and bringing peace there. 
operating notice from the inside outwards. This piece comes from the inner man, woman, man, uh, man embraces woman today. Okay, tired. Um, you get the picture. The inner heart of a person. The peace of Christ operates there from the inside outwards, from the centre of the personality towards the world in which we live. Now, <clears throat> Paul has been talking a little bit earlier on about the value of externalities, right? The things we put around the outside of us to, uh, to sort of, like a, an exoskeleton scaffolding holding up a rocky building, you know, a shaky building. Um, that's the value of those things. See, Paul says they're of little value in restraining sensible indulgence. They're of little value. I had a discussion with a thoughtful young leader in a public, local, not local to here, but an away congregation, about this sort of thing in the, in the context of church membership last week. He said, but you know, how, how can you manage without having a, you know, your membership list and people have to sort of come into membership and if there's a problem, the elders go around and see them and tell them if they don't behave, they'll be thrown into membership. <laughs> Is this church membership as a means of social control? Is that how it works? Yeah, it is how it works. In a lot of places, that's how it works. Um, I honestly think you'd be, you know, if I came out to see you, you'd be more concerned I'd come out to see you and you'd upset me. <laughs> Something going on like that? I honestly think if I came out to see you about something, I'd come out with a bit of Bible in my hand and I'd say, hey, yes. And you'd be a lot more concerned about that than upsetting me. Times very rare when over the years I've had to go and see someone say, please don't do this. It hasn't been church membership that's been their worry. I'll be going to boot you off the list. Not at all. What a way to try and form Christian character. By a constitution? And a membership list? Yeah, it sounds weird when I say it like that, but that's well that's what we walked away from, isn't it? That's what we come away from. The whole point is that the peace of Christ should rule in our inner being. The transformation in Christian context is from the inside, from the, the, the heart of a man or woman, from the, the inner being. And Paul is saying here, let that peace of Christ rule. Not in this sort of external social structure which tells us, and, and you know, because of my standing with the person next to me, I need to appear to be a person of peace. But from the inside out, I need to know that coming back daily to putting Christ back on the big seat. Ruling in my heart. Now that word for rule, as I just alluded, is an interesting word. And you can't see it because the sun is shining on the screen. And it's in red. Rabuo it is. And it's a word that uh, occurs only here in the New Testament. So you have to do a little bit of work. Then. If you've got a set of words in the New Testament, in that time and context, that place, uh, you know, you can work out from the context of all those different things taken together, what the word means. But here, we've only got one occurrence in the New Testament, so you've got to go outside there somehow. And what tends to happen is that people go back to the Greek Golden Age, to Euripides, in the 5th century BC. And they say, in Euripides, this guy is like the umpire in the games, in the Roman games. He's the empire, um, empire. He's the umpire, and he's the bloke who blows the whistle and runs the games, and at the end of the day, he gives the presents out, you know, the prizes, right? Uh, so what? Uh, how many words in common use today have changed their meaning a very great deal in the last 500 years? Mm. So you can't rely on that, can you? Be lovely. I mean, you could preach a really good sermon around that. Okay? You know, the peace of Christ, the, uh, the umpire who blows the whistle when you're, you know. Imagine the flights of fancy. But that's what they are. Because that's not necessarily what the word meant then. So you hear that, be aware of it. By the first century, by the time Paul was using this, okay, that's in history somewhere, but, but judge, decide, control, or rule, that's what we're on. Yeah. Operate as judge, decide, rule, control. Let your decision making processes, let whatever be, be conditioned by the peace of Christ. It's in your heart, because Christ is in your heart. He's brought his peace with him, and also he's given it to you. And the big reason for this now comes into play. Here's the motivating reason. The peace of Christ is Christ's peace, it's in your hearts, let it rule there. Here's the reason, it is your calling. And that's a bit strong. Isn't that a bit strong? 
I mean, come on, we're evangelical Christians. Our calling is to win the world for Jesus! Yeah! We'll come back next week and talk about it again. Paul is saying, as members of one body, you were called to peace. This is an essential part of your calling from Christ. Now you know and I know the difference it makes when we're chatting with perhaps some you know, people my age, I'm talking to guys in a minute, sorry. It'd be similar but different. Okay? Um, to you one of the guys in the night, you're talking to some guy who's in a similar sort of position in life to you, you know? And the things of family life and all the rest of it, coming away and work and employment and all the rest of it. What actually gets across to that guy that there's some reality about Jesus? The call to peace. That says a lot about Jesus. When they see that happening, it says a lot. Now, of course, we'll all enflesh that in different ways, okay? You know, younger people, you'll enflesh that in a certain way. You know, ladies, you'll enflesh that in a certain way. Kids in school, you'll enflesh that in a certain way. But there's the issue. Here's the central issue in our calling, and that speaks volumes to the world that we are to live in. This piece at the centre of our personality, radiating out through now properly controlled actions, that forms an essential part of the eternal plan and purpose of God, and it speaks volumes to a world that doesn't trust Jesus. It's what Jesus came to bring. We've seen that already with blood on the cross. And as he prepares to leave his disciples for the job of restoring the creation from chaos to consummation, the seas there, and return to his Father in glory. As he's setting about that, hear his words again. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things, and will remind you of everything I've said to you. Fine, that's okay then. Peace I leave to you. My peace I give you. Don't give us the world views. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. If I had the time and the energy and I didn't have to work and make money to sustain the basic dregs of ministry that's left while you're having to do that, I'd be writing a book today about fear. Fear. It is a crucial, crucial issue for us and for the churches. Fear. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid in the peace I leave. My peace I give you. Here's the centre of it. In John 14, 27. If you want a memory verse for the week, there's a prayer. He comes with peace. And just as he wants his followers to practice his presence, he wants them to embody the peace that comes with him when he comes. In a world that desperately, desperately needs to know that peace. From the right place. And the situation in Colossae wasn't like that, and it needed to be, and it wasn't like that because their relationship with Jesus had gone apart because of the heresy they'd been brought. How important was this? How important? We've been talking about a lot of sort of pretty high, deep, cosmic level stuff. Your peace and mind, letting the peace of Christ rule in our hearts as, as they face the battering of the storms, the practical details of everyday life. Trust me, yours and mine both. It is of great cosmic significance, as great as that. Why? Because look, here is the eternal plan and purpose that God set out in Ephesians 1. He made known to us, says Paul in Ephesians 1, the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment. What is it to bring all things together again? In heaven and on earth, together under one head, even Christ. There's the plan, there's the purpose, to unite, to bring together again, under the headship of Christ. To bring peace into a world that's been busted up by sin. Getting on with one another in a church is as important as fulfilling the eternal plan and purpose of God. That's why he's writing Colossians in this way. Because the eternal plan and purpose of God is to bring all things together again under the hedge of Christ in the church. Mm. So when there's not peace in the church, how damaging is that? I don't think, I don't think we've got any problems in it. You know, chilling. But, uh, but, but that's how important it is. How do I aspire to managing that? Well, Paul gives us one practical tip, just the one. 
But how do you do it? Because you do come to church and there are people who are different from you and there are people who are really annoying. And you could see yesterday this gathering of Christians I didn't know, which was great. You could look around the room and you could see just who were the in crew and who were the annoying ones. Did you do that in student settings? It's quite easy. There's, there's the annoying ones. How do you do it? There's one practical tip, just the one that Paul gives us, which is the key we must turn in the lock and we spotted it. Paul moves on from the high, cosmic and lofty to the street level, grassroots, gritty, in one easy step. Just a step, it isn't even a bound. Do you remember those boys' adventure books in the 50s and 60s and 70s? <coughs> you know, there's the hero in his hand. With a bound, he was free! Right? <laughs> one simple bound. Paul goes from this high, cosmic, lofty stuff, the peace of Christ that's got a rule in your heart, to how you, how you going to say about doing that practical one, just one little tip. Here it is. The key we need to habitually turn in the lock. Be thankful. Oh, this hurts. I've got to preach this now. Be thankful. <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh, dear, oh, dear. Oh, Lord. Be thankful. There's the practical solution for the peace born of the cross, for the individual application of that peace to my life, for the daily application of this peace to my soul as I return to my God with the discipline of thankful praise. Pardon? With a grateful heart. He thanks with a grateful Full heart. heart. I got a song for that. <laughs> Look, did you notice all this time, we spent all this time talking about peace, and you haven't heard yet, my conclusion, you haven't heard yet one word about tea lights, aromatherapy, mud packs, goat's milk bars, and sitting cross legged on the floor saying, oh, have you noticed that? <laughs> have you noticed that? It's amazing. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you are called to peace, and you say you did. Now it's all about your relationship to God, his peace, in a Christian context. And whilst all those other things I was mentioning just then, they can be very pleasant and very helpful in so many ways, it's not all about that class of things that Paul tells us are of no value in restraining sensual and indulgence. It's about your relationship with Jesus. I must understand, I'm not against the use of those means that God has given us for rest and relaxation and so forth, and the candles in the bath does it for you. Great. These are means that God has given. But they are means, they are props, they are helps, and we make a huge mistake when we look to the gift rather than the giver, when we substitute the things he's given for the God who is himself our peace. And that's a mistake we can make. My life would be so much simpler, easier, and peaceful if, yes, if I can sort out that relationship with Jesus again. If I can keep on top of the weeding around the plant of the peace that he brings into my life. And if I can take that tip Paul gives me, just right at the end they're quietly slipping it in. Did you notice? How neat is that? Our need is to take captive the stray chaotic thoughts. Our need is to see Christ back in throne here as King, bringing the peace that He created and conveys to the core of our personalities, rooted there in the thankfulness and praise of His people, fulfilling the eternal plan and purpose of God. And let me tell you, that is a battle. What you expect it to be, given that's what it is, it's going to be a battle. That's the core of the eternal plan and purpose of God in the individual. And those who oppose the eternal plan and purpose of God are powerful and many. It's a battle. Through which we walk with an all-powerful, all-sufficient Saviour who is himself our peace. As long as we can just stay on top of that. So let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Since as members of one body, you are called to peace and be thankful. Those three big things that will characterize the rebuilt spiritual life of these Colossians once they've dealt with the heresy and got their lives back on track with Jesus. His peace, his word, his deeds. There could have been three points in this sermon. 
but there's still two to go like, the next couple of weeks.